I don't know if this is the case for everyone, um, but it seems like vacation, we start thinking about vacation time, we're kind of coming up on that time where there may be some of you and experience some vacation and then certainly during the summer times, but this is, seems like it's been the case for me in my life and the vacations that I've taken maybe for you as well, that the vacations tend to take on a different flavor depending on the amount of money that is involved, the value that is on and the vacation. All right, if it's, if it's like a cheap vacation, like, you know, you're just kind of going camping and not spending maybe as much money, it seems to be really like a vacation. It seems to be really kind of restful and, and peaceful, and some of that may depend on kind of where you go, but, you know, just kind of get out and, you know, you sleep late and you just kind of roam through the woods or, you know, go play in the lake or whatever. But if you spend like a lot of money to go to like Disney World, I can remember when we were, were little, my, my dad took us to... One of the Disney ones, I don't remember, it's in Florida, whichever one that one is. So we went, and it just seemed like it was different. It didn't really seem like vacation. When you think about vacation, it's supposed to be relaxing, and you know, it, it was like go, go, go all the time, right? You spent all this money to come to this place, and it was wake up early, go to this thing, go to that thing, and you wanted to maximize your time, right? You wanted to maximize your dollars, this, uh, you know, the amount of money that you spent to get here, and so it was like uh, get up as early as you can, stay up as late as you can, and then when you get home, you really need a vacation from your vacation, right? But but even in even in the the lesser intense vacation. There are times when maybe you're like, I just need to go away. I have a friend, uh, a pastor friend, every year, I just want to go, he and his wife every year will go on a cruise, just he and his wife. And I'm, I'm like, well, you know, what, what do you, he does, he's not really the cruise type. Like he's, you know, pasty white skin. He's never out in the sun. Like, what, what are you going to do on a cruise? And he's like, I sleep and I eat. That's all I do for like four days. I'm like, that sounds like a vacation, right? This is even and even then, maximizing your vacation time, right? I want to maximize my time away, my, my time to rest, and I'm going to be intense in that. I think the same idea that we would put towards vacation, whether that, you know, be the, I'm going to maximize my rest or maximize my, you know, my time here in this really awesome place. The Bible teaches us, the Bible talks to us about maximizing our life in general, that putting the same effort, the same intensity of thought and, and, and practice and conviction towards our lives as we do a vacation. And that's really what Paul is going to help us to see this morning. So open back up to Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15. He says, be careful, pay careful attention, then how you walk, not as unwise people, but as wise making the most of the time or redeeming the time because the days are evil. So don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. And don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions, but be filled by the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making music from your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. So just kind of to back up, to kind of bring us into what, where we're continuing on. Paul, last week we talked about this light versus darkness, this old man, this, we lived in the dark, we were dark and, and now we are the light. He talked about the old man and the new man and then he concluded what we talked about last week, get up sleeper, rise up from the dead. Like you, you're, You've been made new, you've been brought to life. Like God has given you life and he wants you to live and so Paul says, okay, so if that's true then you need to pay careful attention to how you walk, making the most of the time because the day's are evil. So what is, what is Paul putting, here, putting forth here? He wants us to pay careful attention. What he means there is to, to put effort towards, to, to scrutinize, to look at what you're doing. Everything in your life, pay careful attention 
to how you walk. There's that word again, how you live your life. He's talked over and over, walk this way. Remember, this is all stemming from chapter four, verse one, walk worthy of the calling that you received. And he's been kind of unpacking this idea over and over about walking, giving us different angles of how we are to walk. And he says, in these thoughts towards how you walk, you need to pay careful attention. And, and really the idea here is with intensity. It's, it's with urgency that we would be thinking about what we're doing because he couples that with making the most of your time or redeeming your time. You're buying the time back. But what Paul is arguing here is we've only got one life to live. You've been raised up. You've been given this life and you've only got one life to live. So with all of your intensity, with all the vigor that you can muster up, live your life to the fullest. Live your life to the fullest that it can be given to the Lord as far as walking in the manner worthy of this calling. We don't have time to waste. We don't have days to take off and and, and say, well, I'm going to go back to being the old man. No, we've got to be the new man. We've got to be the light. We've got to pay careful attention Every moment, every action, every word, every thought, we need to filter it through the lens. We need to pay attention to it. Well, students, you can't just say, well, I'm just a student. I'm just in junior high or in high school. And someday when I'm grown, then, I'll, then I will really want to follow the Lord. College students, this, this is a problem in college life. And our, really our society has kind of perpetuated this four or five year kind of break that you get to have in life. Like just kind of go to school and, you know, live it up and party it up. And then whenever you graduate, then you can get a job and, you know, be a real adult. That's, that's a sad place for a Christian to be. Because college is a great opportunity. And I know most of our college students are gone this morning, but such a great opportunity God has put you in to be a voice, to be a beacon of light. Students in your, in your junior highs and high schools, you're given such an incredible opportunity to live a life worthy of the calling, to be light in the midst of darkness. Paul's saying we don't have time to waste. We've got to make the most of this time. You get this sense of urgency and intensity. This is, this is honestly a hard sermon to give this weekend because most of us for the last three or four days have not, done nothing but watch football and sit around and eat, right? And you're like, oh, yes, yeah, sure, Tim, urgency. Like, I, I'm still trying to work off that turkey I ate, right? And the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes, we can remember Ecclesiastes 3, there's a time for everything, right? That there is a time for vacation. There's a time, but when you're on vacation, you need to be resting or you need to be having family time. And if it's going to Disney World and it's intense and you're, you're making the most of those moments with your family, you're redeeming that time. And if it's, if it's rest and relaxation, you don't want anything, then you're redeeming that time. You're, you're giving your best to the rest so that when you come back, you can live uh, with, with, with intensity here while you're here. When you think about time with your family, Are you making the most of your time? Let me just ask the dads, because I know this is kind of an area that we kind of lump dads into. I'm sure it's a little bit stereotypical. But dads, are you you making the most of your family time? When you're coming home from work, is it sit on the couch and veg? Is it, hey, I'm going to go over here and have me time? Or are you taking, making the most of your days with your family? My kids aren't that old, and I can remember when we just started having kids, and even now people, when you meet people that are older than you and their kids have graduated high school and they're going off to college, maybe getting married, and they tell you, hey, you need to, they grow up really fast, right? They grow up really, what are they telling you? Redeem the time. Make the most of your time with them. The Psalm 144 tells us that our lives are like a vapor. like a shadow. And God has only given us one life. The Bible tells us it's appointed for man to live once and to die once. And we don't know when that will be. And so Paul is saying, you've got to make the most. You've got to maximize this time. And he really gives us a, an even better reason because the days are evil. What does he mean? Well, remember, we're coming out of the darkness versus light uh, uh, idea. And that's what he's building on. 
The days are evil. The days are dark. This culture that you live in is filled with evil. And it needs people who are going to rise up, are going to rise up from their sleep, rise up from their slumber and live as light and, and be a light in this world with intensity. Not just coasting through the days, but waking up every morning saying, I'm going to make the most of my day for the glory of Jesus Christ. And my days are no longer about my own life. My days are now lived for the glory of God. Everything that God has given me, my life, my family, my job, every moment of every day is now to be given to be lived for a calling that is bigger than I am. To live a life worthy of being called a follower of Jesus Christ. That people might see the glory and the goodness of Jesus Christ. How will we spend our days? He gives us these three kind of kind of uns or these kind of don't be this way but be this way. These three uh, phrases that he really locks together and they kind of mean the same thing but they also build on each other. He gives us these three phrases, not as unwise people but as wise. That's the first one. So make the most of your time, redeem your time, Take it back. Use it for good instead of for evil. Your culture is living for evil. Your culture is living for themselves. You redeem it. You buy your time back and live for the glory of God. And he said the first way is don't be unwise. Be wise people. He's just building on the argument. Be wise in understanding and realizing that your days are numbered. You're only given a certain amount of time. But I think he also hears just this idea That God has given us a brain. (laughs) That God gave you a brain. For when we think about following the Lord and being faithful in that, a lot of that just comes down to to wisdom. You're learning the things of God's word. You're learning how to follow him. God's given you a brain to read the Bible and to understand what it means to follow Jesus Christ. We also have other people's brains. There are lots of people in here who've lived a a little bit longer than you probably. Obviously, there's some of you are at the top, and so you're the the ones that we're looking towards. We're we're living our lives on your understanding, on your wisdom. This is why the Bible says that the old men and the old women are to teach the younger men and the younger women. Why? Because you have wisdom. You have the wisdom that we need. And he tells us in James, if we want wisdom, if we want to live as wise people, that we can pray about it, that we will pray and God will give us wisdom. That we are to be a people who are to live as wise, not as unwise. And then he builds on that. He says, so don't be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. That word foolish is the same thing as unwise. Don't be unwise. So he's putting these things together. You have unwise and wise you have foolish or unwise and people who know what the Lord's will is and generally speaking when we think about the will of God there's a a general will of God and then there's a personal will of God or specific will of God and and here Paul is really talking about the general will that we all kind of struggle and we're walking through with like you know do I take this job or you know decisions that are personal to us that we can't find in the word like you can't flip over, you know, John chapter 4 and says, Tim, you need to, you know, go here for lunch, right? Like that's, that, that we, those are personal things that we're all trying to figure out and walk in with the Lord and to understand those personally. But Paul has in mind here something bigger, that we would be a people who understand what the Lord's will is. What is the general will of the Lord? Again, he's been building this argument the whole way and it's all built on four, walk worthy of the calling that you received. This is the general will of God for us to be faithful followers of Jesus Christ. So we don't give in to foolishness. We talked about last week, foolish thinking and foolish acting. We don't give in to foolish humor. No, we're going to understand that our lives are are called now to something bigger, something better. The will of God for our lives is something greater. This light that he has called us into, that he has turned us into, being the light, that is now the will of God for our lives, not foolishness. And then he 
builds on that a little further. He says, let me explain what I mean a little bit. Don't get drunk with wine, which leads to reckless actions. So look what he's doing. He's got unwise, wise, foolish, the Lord's will, being drunk on wine, but rather being filled with with the Spirit. You see what he's doing here? How he's making this argument? He's using this idea of being drunk with wine to prove a point. Now, do I think that Paul is literally saying we should not be drunk with wine? Yes, I think that's what Paul is saying. Drunkenness is a sin. But I think it's bigger here because he explains drunkenness with, with, with drunkenness with wine, which leads to reckless actions, foolishness unwise. That's the category that you would put reckless actions in, right? So he's saying this is a way that we're not going to live. When you get drunk, I've personally never been drunk. I'm not telling you that because it's so great, but I have been around people who were drunk. And generally speaking, I would not put them in the wise category. If you've ever been in that position, I'm guessing most of those times you would say, that was not the wisest thing for me. I did a lot of foolish things in that time. I did some stupid things in that time. That's what Paul is saying. Drunkenness causes these reckless actions. Why? Because it causes you to lose your capacity to think. Again, unwise, not making the right decisions, foolishness. And when, we, when you get drunk or if you use recreational drugs, they put you in a state where you cannot make wise decisions. Your mind is altered, and you're no, no longer making wise decisions based on the will of God. You're making decisions based on an altered state. You're not thinking about what is wise. You're not thinking about what is the Lord's will. You're thinking about whatever, you know, what's going to be the funniest thing, or you're maybe not even thinking at all, right? You're just like, I'll just do whatever. This is why Paul says we are, as a people of God, we not give ourselves to, to drunkenness because it puts us in a state of unwisdom, of not being wise, of foolish thinking. Instead of being wise, knowing and walking in what the Lord's will is, and then he, again, argues a little more that we would be filled with the Spirit, the opposite of living in a place of, of um, disarray or living in a place of, where, where things are just kind of willy-nilly, right? They're just kind of out of order and you're just kind of doing whatever. You're not thinking, you're just kind of doing whatever. No, now, juxtaposed to that is people who are living in the Spirit, who are filled by the Spirit. This is the people of God. We are, we are wise. We're thinking about things. We're thinking about our actions. We're thinking about our thoughts. We're processing everything through the lens of, is this going to give honor and glory to the Lord? Is, is this the will of God for my life? Is this how God intends for his people to live? Am I in a state where I'm following, being filled by the Holy Spirit? The Bible helps us. I think I just want to, before we talk about this spirit, being filled by the spirit. In John 15 and John 16, we're told what the Holy Spirit's primary roles are in our lives. In John 15, 26, it says, when the counselor comes, he will testify about me. This is Jesus speaking. This is the primary role of the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit's job primarily is to testify about Jesus Christ. And then in John 16, he gives us three things that the Holy Spirit will do. It will convict, convict of sin, it will guide in truth, and it will glorify Christ. The Holy Spirit will glorify Christ. Well, how is that going? How does he work that in us? Well, he convicts us of our sin so that we can glorify the Lord. He gives us or he guides us into truth so that we can glorify Christ. So we see that the primary role of the Holy Spirit is to is to glorify Jesus Christ, to make Jesus Christ look really good. The people would see salvation, they would see what it is like to have life in following Christ, and that is who is supposed to fill, uh, that we're supposed to be filled by the Spirit. Now, this isn't, ask, this isn't talking about a second filling, all right, just to be clear here. When we are saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. We receive all of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is given to us. There's not 
The Bible does not teach that there is a second baptism of the Spirit or somehow we grow into maturity and then we suddenly we get more of the Holy Spirit. That's not what Paul is arguing here, that we're going to be filled even more by the Holy Spirit. No, he said you have this Holy Spirit in you and let him fill you. Let him be the one who fills you. We understand this when you say things like, I'm filled with joy. What does it mean that you don't have joy in you at all? No, you have joy. You're just walking in that moment in the joy. Like when you're, like whenever we had our first child, I can remember being at the hospital and filled with joy is is how you would describe it. What does it mean I didn't have joy in me before? No, I I had joy, I I had happiness in me, but this moment caused me to be filled with joy with joy, caused me to be overwhelmed with joy, and I was living that out, I was expressing that. And that's what Paul is arguing. You have the Spirit in you, be filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit guide you, let the Spirit lead you. It's not this extra something. Now, there are certainly times in the New Testament and Acts where you see people being filled by the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues, but there are also lots of other times where you just hear the Bible talking about when Jesus gets baptized, it says he's filled with the Spirit. This isn't some, you know, crazy, charismatic kind of thing, right? This is just who we are as people. This isn't just this kind of one moment experience that I go have this Holy Ghost experience. No, we have the Spirit in us, and Paul tells us to continually be filled with the Spirit. This is an ongoing, normal way that the people of God live their lives, again, he's painting this picture like light and dark. He's painting a picture between unwisdom or un, I don't know if unwisdom is a word, but I'm using it. Unwise, right? To be unwise versus being wise. He's painting this picture here that we will see what it's like to be the people of God. Light and dark, new man, old man, wisdom or unwise and wisdom. And the people who, we who are the people of God, we will be filled continually. We will find our strength. We will find our life. We will find everything in being filled with the Holy Spirit. And then he's going to give us four ways, four particular ways here that, that he fleshes out what this means. So these are the imperatives here. Don't get drunk. That's an imperative. Don't do this. All right. But then the other imperative is be filled with the Spirit. So he's going to help us see what that means. The first the first phrase that he gives us here, speak one, speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spirit, spiritual songs. I don't know how often you do this, but I don't do this a lot. I don't just go around and greet people with, hey, trust, in the Lord, trust and obey in the Lord. Or you know what, I like, I don't, I'm not using these phrases. What is Paul trying to argue here? Seeing the lips of the, you think about the songs that we sing, that they ought to be on our lips to encourage one another. This is why it's important, the songs that we sing, when we think about and we try to incorporate the songs that we're going to sing and worship in here, that they would reflect what the Bible is teaching, that they would be biblically grounded, biblically saturated, most of them. Because if you can think about things that you have memorized. I think when we talk about memorizing, most of us in the room would say, man, Tim, I have a really hard time memorizing things. I have a hard time memorizing scripture. That's what we'd say. I have a hard time memorizing things. I'm just not really, you know, just memory isn't one of my things. Oh, really? I've used that argument before. But I can remember my address when I was 12 years old. (laughs) I can remember my phone number, 325-7405. I can, you can remember songs that you sang when you were 10 years old, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a wee little man was he, right? You sang those when you were little. This is, song is important because songs are a way for us to, to learn and memorize something. And we were going to say we want to learn and memorize scripture, the Bible. We want to be able to speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, When you look in the Bible, lots of times, we talked about this last week, that sometimes they would, you have the book of Psalms, obviously, but sometimes in the reference in in scriptures, they're pulling from songs that they would sing. Because the songs were truth, they were were coupled with scripture. We'd be singing scripture. And so we want to be speaking to one another in those same words. This is the idea that we'd be encouraging one another. 
in the Lord. We'd be speaking to one another in the Lord. But then he also goes on with this singing and making music from your heart to the Lord. So he uses these three words that have to do with speaking to one another in song and then singing and making music from your heart to the Lord. I think that's because God's heart is close to music. I've been around the world. I've been in lots of places in the world, and I think there are two things that speak universally to people. I think one of them is sports. Like everybody kind of gets sports language. Maybe not everybody loves sports, but on some level, sports kind of speaks to a lot of people. But I think music speaks to people. Every culture has music. You go to China, and they have their own music and their own instruments you go to India and they have their own music and their own instruments and you go to Haiti and wherever you go in the world music speaks to people well, why is that I think God put that into us he's saying this is how we live in the spirit and he's telling us man songs are really important we should speak them to each other we should sing them to the Lord we should even make them we should make music to the Lord and some of you this morning you're hearing these verses and you are freaked out (laughs) because you're like Tim I'm a terrible singer (laughs) and I can't play any instruments what am I supposed to do is Paul telling me I've got to go learn how to play the guitar no that'd be really cool if you did be great for your family if you got a little time to learn how to play the guitar and help in family worship time. So what is Paul communicating? Remember, Jamie really touched on it a couple weeks ago. Paul is, is building, building these arguments of how we are to live individually and to the Lord, but also how we are to live corporately. And what I want us to understand and see from this text is that when we come in here and we gather in this place each Sunday, that when we sing to the Lord, we are also speaking to one another. There there is a horizontal part of worship and there is a vertical part of worship. I hope that when you come in this place and you look around each Sunday and you see other people giving their hearts to the Lord. I'm so glad Paul says that, right? Make music from your heart, right? Not your voice. You don't have to sing well. It's okay, right? God cares about your heart. Are you singing from your heart? Is your heart expressing an attitude, expressing thoughts towards the Lord? These songs that we sing, we say, yes, God, you are the only one. We love you, and we sing these songs to the Lord. And there's a vertical sense to that worship where we're telling God that we in our hearts understand that he is God, and we are not, and we're subjecting ourselves to him and saying, God, you are the only one we need. You are the one we trust. We thank you for salvation, all of these things that we that we sing to him and express from our hearts. But there is also a horizontal part to worship. And we come into this place, we ought to be singing joyfully to the Lord so that when we look around, we are encouraged by the songs of the saints. We are encouraged to live out this being spirit-filled. How is this being spirit-filled? Yes, you have the spirit in you to sing these songs, but it also encourages you The spirit works in us when we look around this place and you see that there's a couple of hundred people in here every other week, every week. And you know when you leave this place that you're not the only one who is trying to live a life worthy of the calling that is on you, that you've looked around and you've been encouraged by the saints. You can look down the end of the pew, you can look in the people in front of you and you can see people singing their hearts to the Lord. That's supposed to give you encouragement. It's supposed to encourage you. It's supposed to speak to you. This is why it's important that when we come in this place that we worship. We're not just here to sing songs. The, the, the worship team doesn't come every Wednesday night and come up here early on Sunday morning so they can give you a concert and you can just kind of sit there and marvel at their skill and their ability. That's not what worship is. And that's not the heart of our worship team. And that's never been the heart of worship in this place. The heart of worship in this place is that we would sing glorious, make glorious music to the Lord, whether it's in tune or not, but it would be from our heart. And we would put God on the throne and worship him. And that all of us, as we gather together in this place, would be encouraged by one another's worships, by one another's worship. This is why it's important that You be expressive. 
I'm not saying we've got to dance around with banners or anything like that, but I'm saying there's a time where maybe you're going to raise your hand to, to the Lord. But the people around, not so the people around you would see that, but the people around you will see that and they will be encouraged. Maybe it's you just fall on your knees. Maybe it's just the general countenance. I'm just going to be real honest with you because I've heard, I'll just put this on the worship guys because I'm not up here during worship, but I've been a pastor now for a long time. and There are some Sundays when you come in this place and the worship leaders will tell you, just doesn't look like the people are just really engaged. Her countenance isn't speaking. Man, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm ready to worship the Lord today. Sometimes it's just a general countenance of joy and worship and happiness expressed on our faces. It's coming out of our hearts. I know sometimes you're having a tough week and it's difficult. I understand that. The way that we speak through our songs, the way that we sing and make music in this place ought to be spirit-filled. It ought to be a people who are filled by the Spirit come to give their gratitude and their thanksgiving and their worship to Jesus Christ. And then he says, verse 20, giving thanks always and for everything to God our Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're to be speaking to one another in song. We're supposed to be singing songs. We're supposed to be making music to the Lord. And then he says, people who are spirit-filled also give thanks. We give thanks always. And we give thanks for everything. So I've been thinking about this verse and having to stand up here and preach this verse. So man, Paul, that's, that's really difficult. I mean, here we are in the midst of Thanksgiving. No coincidence that we're here, I'm sure. We come to this verse and, and we have so much to be thankful for. All of us in this room, in the place we live, particularly if you've been around the world, we, we're just a blessed people, not just because we're Christians, but the place that we live, the country that we live in, the freedoms that we afford, the wealth that, that 90% of us have in this country. I really are just a blessed people. But there are certain times that life is hard. I know for some people in our church, this first Thanksgiving of walking through without loved ones who have recently passed away, this, is a, this can be a hard time. Paul says, give thanks always and for everything. How do we do that? I think we remember the Holy Spirit's job. This is in the context of being filled with the Holy Spirit. We remember what is the Spirit's job? The Spirit's job is to glorify Christ. And if what it means to be Spirit-filled is, means to be glorifying to Christ, then it means that we can give thanks in all things and always. It doesn't mean that we're happy may not have joy in that moment. It doesn't mean we, we might not have happiness in that moment, but we can give thanks because that moment is an opportunity for the Spirit to work in us and for us to glorify the Lord. When you're walking through difficulty, you can say thank you to the Lord because this difficulty is an opportunity for you to glorify God as his follower, as someone who says, I'm going to live According to this new calling, according to this new man, this new woman that God is creating to me, and this light that God has created in me, I'm going to live in such a way that God, that Jesus Christ would get glory. God, thank you for this. Because the reality is, it is in the difficulty that his followers make Jesus look the best. It's when we go through tragedy or we go through difficulty or we go through tough times and we respond in a spirit-filled way that trusts the Lord, that loves the Lord, that believes that God is good, that shines the light on the darkness of this world. When you go through difficulty and tragedy and you're thankful to the Lord and you have this opportunity Again, you don't have to be happy in it. 
I'm not saying that it's not difficult. He said, God, thank you that you've given me this opportunity to live for your glory. The world will look at you and they will think, what is, what is wrong with you? And you will have every opportunity to tell them about the glory of Jesus Christ who saved you. Whom you've put your hope in. Whom you can trust above all things. And give thanks always and for everything. We also give thanks always and for everything for the good things. Not, not just the bad things, okay, we, we work through that. What about the good things in our life? We must be making sure that the good things in our life, that we are giving thanks to the Lord for those things. Those are not our own doing, that God has made us who we are. He's given us the abilities that he's given us, and God is working through us, and we can look around at our families and our, our jobs and our home, whatever it is that you have that you're thankful to, that you're thankful for, you ought to be thankful for the Lord particularly during this Thanksgiving time, have you taken a moment to just turn your heart to the Lord and say, God, thank you. I don't deserve any of this. What I deserve based on the life that I've lived according to you in my sin, what I deserve is death and wretchedness and your grace that you give to me, your common grace that you pour out to man, And we ought to be the most thankful people in the world for what Jesus Christ has done in us. And then the last thing in verse 21, he says, submitting to one another in the fear of Christ. This is all one sentence that's going to flow in. We don't have time this morning to keep going. But I want us to understand verse 21 in the context that it needs to be understood in. Submitting to one another in the fear of Christ, that all of us on some level submit to one another. What Paul is arguing here is what he's already fleshed out, that we would live in such a way of having humility towards one another, considering one another above ourselves. That's that's the general sense. But Paul is going to, when we get back from Advent, he's going to help us understand particular ways that we submit to one another. We don't all submit to each other in the sense of that we're all submissive to one another or no one would be leading anyone. If everyone's leading everyone, no one's leading anyone. Does that make sense? But all of us are submissive to someone. And he's going to flesh that out. That's why he's going to talk about husband and wives and children and parents and slaves and masters. He's going to help us see that. But there is an understanding here that Paul wants us to see that in the fear of Christ, in following the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would submit ourselves to one another. What is best for the other? This is setting up the the idea. So when we start talking about um, wives submitting to their husbands, this isn't a a, a power trip. He's setting up this idea that really we're we're all subject, we're, we're doing this out of love and concern, out of service, out of submitting to one another. So even as the husband leads his wife, it's really a role of submission. He's submitting himself to being a godly leader over his wife. When the wife submits to the husband, we're really all kind of submitting to the Lord. What the Lord wants, how the Lord has designed it, how Christ intends for us to live. And again, I'm glad that we've come to do communion today because I don't think there's any greater picture of submission and Jesus Christ, and I don't think that anyone would look at Jesus and see someone on a power trip or also see someone that's just going to get walked over. And Jesus submits himself to the will of the Father, and he comes and lives victoriously over sin. And yes, he gives himself on the cross, but he raises on the third day to prove that he has the power and the domain over the enemy. He's made a way for us to experience and know salvation. But all of that came because God submitted himself to the Father and in a sense submitted himself to what we needed. He became the sacrifice for our sins. He 
submits himself to the will of the Father to take on to be the sacrifice that you and I need him to be. It's the greatest example of what it means to submit to one another. It's like Paul's already argued, that we would live our lives not just for our own selves, not just for our own regards, but for the regard of others. What is good for others? This is who we are to be. This is what it means to be spirit-filled people. We have the songs of God on our lips that we're singing and making music to the Lord, that we're always giving thanks. No matter what is happening in our lives, we're giving thanks to Jesus Christ that he would allow us to walk through this to give him glory, submitting ourselves to one another in the fear of Christ. So as we come this morning to take communion, I just want to encourage you I want to encourage you to look at what it means in the text this morning to be spirit-filled and evaluate your life based on these things. Am I someone that just has a joyful expression of singing, singing to the Lord? I'm just, man, I'm just singing psalms and hymns, man, just the ways of the Lord and the things of the Lord are always on my lips. When I come in this place, am I come ready to worship? and sing and make music to the Lord. Do I, do I, am I a person who is thankful? Am I a person who is thankful for what God is doing in my life? Am I a person that lives for other people? I want to help other people. I want to serve other people. When we look at the life of Jesus as we take communion this morning, just encourage you to allow those things to just filter through your heart. Allow the Lord to speak to you. Maybe show you some areas that you need to grow, that you need to change in.